Hello and welcome to this, the latest in our series of webinars from the IEA Clean Coal Centre, and it is latest because the PIN number would not work. <laughs> My name is Colin Henderson and I will be presenting today on upgrading and efficiency improvement in coal-fired power plants which is the topic of my latest report to be published soon by the Centre. If you have any questions, you'll see that you can submit these as text using the box near the top of your screen. If you do, after the main presentation, I will do my best to answer these. The slides that you will see today will also be available to download shortly afterwards from the webinar area of the Clean Coal Centre website. The report itself will be issued in about two months when residents of Clean Coal Centre member countries and employees of sponsoring organisations will be able, after registration, to download it at no charge via the Publications tab on the website. Six months later, it will be available to anyone to download for free after registering. The latter now applies to any of our reports from six months after publication. In my talk today, which will take about 30 minutes, I will cover the following areas. First, I'll introduce the topic and provide some additional background. Then I'll move on to a brief discussion of the types of technical measures generally applied. After this, I'll describe some illustrative projects before moving on to some national and international initiatives, before summing up with my final thoughts. Okay, let's get started on the main presentation at last. The efficiencies of coal-fired plants will normally decrease over time as components suffer deterioration with age and use. But the losses that develop during plant use in the earlier part of the life of a plant are generally containable by employing good operating and maintenance practices. However, after about 25 to 30 years of operation, performance and reliability will usually have decreased to the extent that substantial works, known as retrofits, may be merited in order that the unit may be restored to operating efficiently and economically. Retrofits, which are the main subject of this presentation, also importantly provide the opportunity to take advantage of technology advances made since the plant was originally constructed and therefore to achieve even higher efficiencies. There is still a large number of older coal-fired power plants worldwide that could potentially be retrofitted to give major reductions in CO2 emissions. And here I'm talking of perhaps hundreds of millions of tonnes. Retrofits may provide other benefits too. They'll often ensure a life extension for the plant. They often increase its output even for the same rate of fuel burn. In some cases, retrofits are aimed at enabling a different, maybe cheaper, but more difficult coal to be fired. And some retrofits will increase operational flexibility, all of which, of course, together with the saving in specific coal consumption and emissions, contribute to making the plant more economic to operate. This next slide is a very simplified flow diagram of a conventional coal-fired power unit. I have color-coded some of the main equipment areas so that I can explain easily without switching to different slides. Coal is pulverized to a fine dust in the mills shown towards the left of the figure and colored orange. Air from the primary air fans, colored dark gray, is heated in the air heater, colored red, and also fed to the mills, and the coal dust is conveyed by the air to burners mounted in the walls of the boiler, shown in yellow. Additional combustion air from the secondary air fans, also shown dark grey, is fed to the boiler after preheating. The coal burns as it enters the boiler, and the heat from the fireball is absorbed by water that is pumped at high pressure through tubing in the boiler. The water evaporates and the steam is further heated and allowed to expand through the steam turbine, shown here in blue, which turns an alternator producing the power. The expanded steam is recondensed into water in the condenser, shown here green, and the water is pumped back under pressure to the boiler. Other major systems include the cooling system that supplies cold water to the condenser to condense the steam, the flue gas cleaning systems, and the furnace ash removal systems. And of course the steam water circuit is also much more complex than shown here. Of course this is just a typical 
broad idea of a coal power plant. There are differences from one plant to another. This slide shows the principal areas that can contribute to efficiency shortfall. All areas can contribute to a decrease of efficiency as the plant ages, but the areas of principal influence are in the boiler area, which I've circled in red, and in the turbine area, circled in blue. For these purposes, I'll define the boiler area as covering, among others, all its internals, including burners and heat extraction surfaces, the air heater, air supply fans, and coal pulverizers, while the turbine area includes the turbine internals, the valves, and the condenser. In some countries, upgrading and efficiency improvement activities are fairly common, um, pretty routine. Here I'm talking about countries where there has historically tended to be a stock of well-maintained plants fueled by bituminous coals. Examples are in the EU, Australia, and other OECD countries. At such plants, turbine retrofits on their own have proved to be very worthwhile, and valuable increases in output and efficiency have been achieved. The picture here shows a low-pressure turbine at Drax in the UK, updated with new blades as part of a major turbine retrofit by Siemens on all six turbines. At such plants, major boiler retrofits have not always been necessary, but they have been found to be valuable where there has been a major change in the fuel taken, for example, to more flagging coals. Also, sometimes the capacity of the mills may be increased where sufficient margin exists in the boiler design for increased output and where the retrofitted turbine can take advantage of this. In other parts of the world, efficiency and output decline with plant age often tends to be greater for a variety of reasons. These plants tend to be in predominantly non-OECD or developing countries. Major boiler retrofits are usually needed as well as turbine retrofits in these cases, and the factors responsible include less adequate maintenance because of shortages of resources resulting in, for example, tube failures. Um, the generally older and smaller plants that tend to predominate in these countries, and they often use low steam parameters, incidentally. Also, an influence can be pressure on the owner to continue operating even if a major component has failed, for example, a feed water heater, because power is in short supply in the country and, and generation needs to continue, even if the efficiency has fallen off. And to compound the problems, often the poorer coals tend to be in these countries, uh, for instance, in, in Indian parts of China, which cause extra wear and excessive power consumption on those parts of the plant, for instance, pulverizers. The picture shows pulverizer upgrades by Budcock and Wilcox Power Generation Group at the Suralea Power Plant in Indonesia. Now, before I give a few illustrative projects, I have a couple of slides summarizing the technical measures that are commonly applied during retrofits. The figures at the bottom are referenced in the Clean Co Center report, as are all the third party figures in this presentation. So here we can see an example of modern blade designs. Such blades offering much higher turbine efficiencies have been developed by all the major manufacturers using 3D computer modeling techniques. Generally, a new rotor will be fitted at the same time, and often the number of turbine stages is increased. Replacement inner casings are also commonly fitted together with new stators. Improved sealing is also incorporated and means to minimize wear during the cool conditions of start-up are available. The outer casings of turbines are usually retained. Replacement turbine valves with lower pressure drops and better resistance to cycling are also usually installed, and it may be appropriate to replace or fit new tubes to the condenser for better performance, and feed water heaters may require replacement. So those were lots of uh, areas on the turbine side. On the boiler side, the technical measures that may be applied might include, for instance, putting in modern burner designs offering lower NOx with high burnout, pulverizer upgrades for greater output or a better, more consistent product to allow more consistent combustion, 
advanced monitoring systems, uh, for instance, on the cold analysis or monitoring the fireball. Um, other modifications can involve upgrading of fans and pumps for improved flexibility without wasting power. And then, of course, we have the redesign of heat transfer surfaces to give additional area and use of better materials to withstand the conditions better and air heater improvements to increase performance and reduce cross-leakage to save fan power and reduce flue gas losses. Another addition may be intelligent subflowing systems. The report describes over 20 example projects from the USA, EU, Australia, South Africa, Indonesia, uh, India and China. The next 10 or so slides show a selection of these. So the first example is the upgrading of this 6 by 350 megawatt plant in South Africa to 6 by 400 megawatt. To keep up with fast growing power demand, ESCOM, the state power generator, has a three-pronged policy of increasing capacity in the country. The first is introduction of new supercritical plants. These are the 6 by 800 megawatt plant at Madupi and the similar one at Kusili. The second part of the strategy was the demothballing of mothball plants, which is now completed. And the third part is the upgrading program, as at Arnott here. The six units at Arnott opened in the 1970s and were actually themselves brought back into service in the 1990s after a period of mothballing there. The retrofit project completed in 2010 and carried out by Alstom covered the boiler, high pressure, intermediate pressure and part of the low pressure turbines, the condensers and some other components. The large increase in output was facilitated by an already generous original furnace size which had been based on a larger design by Alstom and they were the original plant supplier and a life extension of 20 years was also sought. The slide here summarises the extensive programme of works carried out at Arnott. New rotors and blading, new inner casings with stator blades, and new seals were installed in the high pressure and intermediate pressure turbines. The low pressure turbine first stage blades were also replaced to increase their swallowing capability to suit lower crossover and extraction steam pressures. The capacities of the coal mills were increased by upgrading the gearboxes and fitting larger classifiers and other modifications. And new primary air fans and burner nozzles were installed. These were to achieve the correct ratio of primary and secondary air velocities for the upgraded output and they also gave, allowed better turn down and less fouling as well as they should offer further scope for reducing NOx. New heater elements and seals were incorporated in the air heaters and the elements themselves were installed by ASCOM. Part of the superheater and reheater were also upgraded using better materials to permit the higher output and additional rows of economizer surface were added within the existing support structure. The project was highly successful, and here are some highlights. Uh, the power output was better than target, as you can see there, 406, 409 megawatts, a couple of them, at me. Um, about 15 megawatts of the additional power from each unit came from the increased efficiency, uh, and NOx emissions were significantly lowered. Um, the 15 megawatts is equivalent, if you look at it quickly, to about 4% higher efficiency, so uh, about a one and a half percentage point gain, approximately. So this is all ensured by conducting a wide-ranging feasibility study for the whole plant, as um, suppliers of such retrofits invariably do. This next example is from India. The four-unit Guru Nanak Dev thermal plant in Bathinda is owned by the Punjab State Power Corporation Limited. The retrofitting and uprating from 110 megawatts to 120 megawatts of units at this plant are a good example of what could be achieved in India. NASL is a joint venture of NTPC, which is the nationalised generator who own about a quarter of the plant in India, and Alstom Power Systems in Germany, and is carrying out several projects in India. Of course, in India there are power shortages, so that even quite modestly sized units are considered worth improving to keep them in use. 
These four units date from the 1970s and fire a bituminous coal of higher heating value about 17,000 megajoules per kilogram. It's a typical Indian high ash bituminous coal and is transported more than 1,500 kilometers by rail from Jharkhand in eastern India. And that in itself isn't particularly unusual for India, carting the coal a long way. The project involves renovation and modernization, in other words, retrofitting of all the units and operating of units three and four from 110 megawatt to 120 megawatt. The extensive measures included, among other activities, mill and air heater upgrades, reblading of the high pressure and low pressure turbines, including new diaphragms, as well as installation of new valves, new high pressure feed water heaters, and replacement of the control systems. As a result of the retrofit, Units 1 and 2 are now running at close to full capacity, and the operated Unit 3 was reported late last year as expected to be in full operation in December, just gone, while work on Unit 4 was then well advanced. This is another plant in India. It's actually a lignite plant dating from 1978. Again, NASL carried out the retrofit project, including an operating from 110 to 120 megawatts. Savamati has four lignite units. Unit D is actually the oldest one, opened in 1978. The project carried out in 2003 included a turbine retrofit with new high pressure, intermediate pressure and low pressure rotors, redesign of the reheater to match the retrofitted turbine and installation of new control systems. And as a result, this unit has successfully operated for five years at the 120 megawatts, at better than the guaranteed heat rate, and an average plant load factor, capacity factor of over 95%. Sometimes coal may be the main, re may be the main reason behind a plant's degraded performance, the coal rather than the plant. So highly slagging coals, for example, can present severe difficulties. Jeffrey Energy Centre's Unit 3 is a 780 megawatt subcritical unit opened in 1983, which fires a Powder River Basin subbituminous coal. This plant had frequent derates and outages over many years because the furnace exergas temperature was in excess of the ash fusion temperature. And this was giving severe slagging and fouling, causing tube leaks, plugging of pendant heat transfer surfaces and molten ash carryover as far as the economizer. Previously, adding additional salt blowers, changing to heating surfaces, and additional instrumentation had not prevented these problems. So an intelligent salt blowing system was installed in February 2009. This smart clean so-called system monitors the condition of key areas of the boiler and controls salt blower operation, while the blowers themselves have variable intensity. The system continuously monitors ash accumulation in two ways. First, strain gauges on which the pendant heat exchangers are hung measure the mass of the deposits. Secondly, the system continuously monitors the thermodynamic efficiency of each heat exchanger, and the information gathered by these monitoring methods is processed, and then the control system switches on and adjusts the intensity of operation of the salt blowers as required in the relevant part of the plant. This system has successfully reduced the number of sub-blowing operations and eliminated the forced outages and derates arising from fouling, and the heat rate has been improved by 0.87%, so that's equivalent to an efficiency increase of around 0.3 percentage points. Major plant efficiency improvements need not be confined to subcritical plants. Fargo is a 350 megawatt bituminous coal-fired supercritical unit in Germany, opened in 1967, it's owned by E.ON. Its steam conditions are 24.5 megapascals, 545, 545 Celsius. By the time the decision was made to modernize, it had completed 200,000 hours with 4,400 startups, and its performance was below modern standards. The retrofit project was commissioned from Siemens in 2004. Most of the work was carried out on the turbines and condenser. For the turbines, the rotors were replaced and new blading used for the earlier stages. 
New inner casings were incorporated in the high pressure and intermediate pressure turbines, and a replacement condenser was installed with fewer tubes, yet allowing a lower exit pressure on the turbine. The outcome of this very successful retrofit was that output increased by 22 megawatts and efficiency increased from 39.4 to 42.3% on a low heating value net basis, mostly as a result of just those uh, turbine and condenser works. The experience here illustrates that there are now older supercritical plants that are sufficiently below current new performance to justify upgrades. Sargo was a mature supercritical plant that had scope for efficiency improvement, but my next example here shows that looking for potential losses in quite new systems can yield surprising benefits. It also incidentally shows that valuable developments come from all countries. Wagakou number three plant in Shanghai, China, which I won't try and pronounce again, which opened in 2008 has 2,000 megawatt USC units employing steam parameters of 28 megapascal 605-603 at the boiler headers. The owners have been active since the start of construction, in fact, in optimizing the plant. The diagram on the right shows the areas of efficiency improvement that have been measured. These range from the fairly conventional such as improved air heater sealing, to low temperature acid dew point resistant flue gas coolers, which don't actually have plastic heat exchange materials to protect them, to revised boiler startup procedures using the adjacent unit to convert a cold startup to a hot startup, solid particle erosion of the turbine by oxides detached from boiler tubes is a familiar problem in, in USC plants and it has been tackled here by adjusting start-up and operating regimes and using higher flushing energies. The figure on the left shows the IP turbine blading after 30 months at this plant. The approach here appears conventional, but carefully designed to be very effective. These and other examples from the plant shown in the pie chart show that it is possible to move to efficiencies at a higher level using the same steam conditions by continuing to focus on detailed areas of potential loss. The boiler incidentally is an Alstom design and the turbine is a Siemens design. But all the innovations have come from the Chinese operators. Moving to lignite drying. Lignite containing 50 to 65 percent moisture are used for power generation in quite a few countries. The systems using these coals extract furnace gas from the boiler to evaporate the moisture and convert the lignite and water vapor to the, and convey the lignite water vapor over to the burners. This restricts generation efficiency leading to high CO2 emissions. Pre-drying high moisture lignite using low grade heat and use of a revived boiler configuration would raise efficiency by around four percentage points. And a couple of drying processes are shown here in the slide. Um, existing boilers firing high moisture lignite could use up to about a quarter of their fuel input in pre-dried form produced in a, in a plant of this sort of design, increasing their efficiency by a percentage point. Um, RWE's WTA process, which is one on the left, is currently operating in that way, supplying a quarter of the fuel. So it's running at full commercial scale because it's supplying the fuel to a 1,000 megawatt USC unit in Germany. The WTA unit is running at equivalent of 250 megawatts equivalent fuel supply, which is the full commercial scale for this technology, which is available now through licensed suppliers. And this could give say even on a plant without modifications, a one percentage point gain, so two and a half, three percent so in CO2 emissions. National and international programs to drive plant improvements are expected to play an important role in moving to lower CO2 emissions. Australia's Energy Efficiency Opportunities Program is aimed at encouraging large energy users, including large generators, 
to improve the identification of energy saving opportunities so that they will voluntarily invest to achieve paybacks through the savings. In India, there are large numbers of coal-fired units above 100 megawatt capacity that are candidates for retrofitting. The non-reheat units of 100 megawatt and smaller will be closed, but the power deficit means that most plants will be kept open. Under a major plant renovation and modernization initiative, 19 gigawatts of capacity are being renovated under the 11th five-year economic plan running to 2012, and 5 gigawatts under the 12th plan now running to 2017. The Partnership in Excellence program is another initiative that tackles both technical and non-technical issues. And here I mention also the long-running USAID CENTEAP program in India involving technical assistance and training for NTCP engineers by US DOE and utilities experts. And over the years, this has allowed over 100 million tons of CO2 to be sustainably saved. Over 16 years, in fact. Other important programs are the Asia-Pacific Partnership on Clean Development and Climate. Among the activities of the APP has been promoting best practices in the power industry. An example was cooperation with USAID in the production of a best practice manual for India to publicize the best examples of innovations developed by the engineers of the generation companies within the country. Work on efficiency improvements under the Power Working Group of the Clean Energy Ministerial Global Superior Energy Performance Partnership, that's a mouthful, will build upon the work of the APP. In June 2012, China announced a new policy to upgrade and improve the efficiency of its older existing coal-fired power plants through boiler and turbine retrofit. So this is really good news. There's so much capacity there. By 2015, more than 800 units of total capacity, over 350 gigawatts, are planned to have completed or be carrying out works with an estimated saving in coal consumption of over 14 million tonnes of coal equivalent per year. So that would be about 30 million tonnes a year of CO2, which I wonder may be a little bit um, pessimistic. I think they may get better savings than that. The initiative will offer financial incentives and preferential dispatch will be given to the most improved plants. I'm coming to the end now of this presentation, and this penultimate slide summarizes the main points. First, upgrading works or retrofits on older coal-fired power plants restore efficiency and output and provide other economic benefits to the plant owner. Major savings in CO2 emissions could be achieved from retrofitting the large number of old subcritical units. Upgrading services are offered by many suppliers around the world, and I have outlined some example projects, and the report contains many more. While subcritical plants dating from a few decades ago are the main focus of efficiency improvement projects, some supercritical plants have reached the age where upgrades can usefully be applied to them. Actually, it's important continually to seek out potential losses that may be capable of being reduced even in new plants, as we've seen on that China plant. Lignite pre-drying technology is commercially available and would reduce CO2 emissions considerably, and there are important programs around the world to drive efficiency improvements. Finally, um, further advancing the efficiency of all fossil power generation is important. There are interesting developments in many countries from which all can benefit through international collaboration. Well, thank you very much for listening. Do download the report when it becomes available. And if you have any questions now, I'll endeavour to answer them. As I'm waiting, this is a convenient slot to let you know that the next Clean Coal Centre webinar will be given by Dr. Nigel Dong on Wednesday, the 10th of July at midday UK time, and the subject of his webinar will be coal and gas competition in the global markets. And again, apologies for the, the, the late start, which was, uh, for some reason, we don't know, the, the PIN number was not working on 10 tries, and finally it was fixed. Now, I have a question here in already. 
Do I have a feel for the economics of the upgrades? Which improvements are likely to be the most cost effective? Most cost effective, I suppose it depends where you are, but basically the turbine improvements tend to be very cost effective, certainly in the already fairly well maintained plants in uh, particularly in Western countries. Um, give you an idea of the sort of costs, it's sort of how long is a piece of string, but a turbine retrofit might be of the order of 50 to 100 million pounds for a, a pretty large turbine system, although it can be less, it depends how much is, is, is changed. Um, it would be lower price in a country such as India. Um, a boiler retrofit would probably be 100 to 200 million, but I think the turbine is probably the most cost effective if you can get a a couple of percentage point improvement, certainly if you, if you work on the condenser as well. The next question I have here is, do I have a feel for the economics of the, oh, that's the same one, I'll go up. You did not cover, I think, retrofitting conventional old plant to supercritical and USC. Is this being considered? So, and then there's supplementary to that. Um, yes, I didn't mention it, um, it's in the report. It's, it's something which has been considered in countries, including the UK, a couple of plants. Uh, feed studies were done for conversion of subcritical to ultra-supercritical. Um, it is a, a sort of retrofitting, but really all, all you're keeping is the, uh, the very large like some common services like the cooling system, the FGD, the coal supply and so on. Almost everything else has to be replaced, so you need a new boiler. You need virtually all the turbine replacing, probably all of it. Uh, new steam tubing and so on, so new steam lines. Um, yeah, and the upshot of this is that there have actually been virtually no uh, projects emerging from these studies, but they have certainly been considered. Uh, the other supplementary to that is, will retrofit to FBC and oxy firing be covered in subsequent reports? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, let me just have a look. Retrofit to oxy firing. I couldn't answer that for sure. Um, it just depends on the program for the IA Clean Coal Centre. We have a program of work which is approved by the Executive Committee, which is governing the work that we do. And if they propose such a piece of work, we'd be delighted to produce a report on it. Okay, well, there don't, don't seem to be any, any further questions. So um, um, I'll say, again, thank you for your interest. And again, apologies for that atrocious five-minute delay. I wondered if I would ever be allowed into the system, but I was in the end. And please don't forget Nigel's webinar on July the 10th. Goodbye.